All right, guys. Um, well, let's just uh, jump right in. So, quick agenda of what we're going to be doing today. I'm still deciding where I want to stand. I think I'll stand here now. Uh, we're going to look into sort of like said, what are the constellations, a quick overview about that, where we got our constellations that we use right now from, what the constellations are used for, both in the past and the present, and then I think a sort of gender around the uh, world and see how different cultures use and uh, view constellations. So, first off, what is a constellation? So, if I asked um, you guys to give me a quick definition, many of you might come up with the one on top, just a group of stars that forms a more a, a particular shape in the sky, has a specific name. A more scientifically correct um, definition would be any one of 88 arbitrary configurations of stars or an area of the celestial sphere covering one of these configurations. Now, the second definition, while a bit more accurate, raises some more questions, namely what is the celestial sphere? And just real quick on that, if we can, we're all familiar with the idea of latitude and longitude. So the celestial sphere is basically those lines extended out onto the sky to make a big spherical grid. When the, uh, the primitive man looked at the sky, they saw the sky as this one you know, moving thing and the earth standing still. So we can think of it as sort of a big sphere, and all the stars are on the sphere and move around. Now this is very wrong, but a very convenient way to think about the sky. It's very similar to the idea of maps. You know, when you're driving on the road and you have a map out, um, you know, the map is flat. And you know that the Earth rises and falls and has you know, different elevations, but it doesn't really matter because the map helps you get where you're going. So we use the celestial sphere to kind of help us get where we're going, and we know where certain constellations are on those parts. So there are a couple types of constellations we also need to learn about. There are uh, the circumpolar constellations and equatorial constellations. Now circumpolar are, uh, just means circles to poles, and there are stars up here like this one which go around and around our celestial pole. So if this guy is standing in the northern hemisphere, we have this gray line as the horizon, so he can only see above, he can only see the sky. All right, makes sense. You can't see below the earth, through the earth to the bottom. So, from his perspective, his point of view, uh, certain stars that are close enough to the celestial pole never rise and never set. They're always above the horizon and they're visible all year round. However, from the southern hemisphere, you couldn't see these northern circle polar constellations. Likewise, the guy cannot see these uh, ones down here in the south. Now, equatorial constellations are ones that are more closer to the equator, and they do rise and set, and rise and set. They come above our horizon and then move below. And so that helps us in the fact that we can see them at certain points in the year, and then when we can't see them, people on the other side of the Earth can. So they're viewable across the entire globe, you know, for the most part, um, but only during certain parts of the year. Now, that depends on where you are on the Earth. So for example, if you are in the very North Pole, all right, all the stars are going to look circumpolar to you because they're all going around you, basically. Now, if you're standing on the equator right here, every star is going to look like a circumpolar star. They will all rise and they will all set because it's where you're positioned. That picture I showed you was sort of, I guess that's probably a pretty close one to kind of where it was, but it wasn't exactly. All right, so. As this example of a circumpolar constellation, we're all pretty familiar with the Big Dipper. Uh, the little dipper's right there, and flash in yellow periodically, and uh, Cassiopeia's right there. And now uh, these are just an example of a, a given night sky, we'll just go in a circle, and we'll never set uh, from our point of view, and we'll always just circle around. Uh, the equatorial constellations are kind of unique in the fact that they're different, well, they're not unique, sorry. It's just depending on where you are, they can look different. So for example, if I have two buddies in the North Pole and the South Pole, and they're each looking at a constellation that's off screen over here somewhere, and I ask what the North guy what he sees, he sees the triangular constellation with one star on top and two on the bottom. If I ask the guy in the South Pole, he sees two on top and one on the bottom. And if we imagine just beaming this guy from here straight up next to the guy in the North Pole, he would, he would be upside down to our point of view of the North Pole. He would have his head where his feet should be. And so it makes sense. If you guys stand up, sit on your head right now, I will be flipped over. So that's why um, as you move across the Earth, the orientation of the night sky appears to change based on how you are standing on the Earth. 
All right, so now we're going to jump into the origin of our constellations, our, our eclipse timeline. So we're going to start around 270 BC with uh, Aratus, a Greek scientist, and listing 42 established constellations. And the Greeks pulled their constellations largely from other cultures. They didn't really make any of their own. They just sort of took Egyptians and Babylonians and stripped away their meaning and added their own stories to them. So he categorized 42. Around 150 BC, um, Hipparius, Hipparchus, I never forget how to say that, right? Uh, he becomes the first man, at least in the Western culture, to accurately chart the stars, recording around 850 stars. He also invented a method of telling of naming the, the brightness of the stars and degrees, and we still use that, that today. All right, um, in the second century, Ptolemy, another Greek scientist, philosopher, mathematician, they're all wrapped into one, he had listed 48 constellations, and he is summarizing from previous works, so he's sort of gathering what other people have to say and writing them down. Um, during the first to the fifth century was the Roman Empire, and the Romans were very influenced by the Greeks, and so, uh, during the fall of the Roman Empire around the 5th century, the Arabs actually were pretty helpful in keeping this knowledge about the constellations alive because the Romans had other things to worry about in the fall of their civilization. Uh, jump way ahead to the 16th century, and now we're starting to see the first printed star charts. Now up until this point we'd have you know, hand-drawn stuff like that, but now we can have <coughs> printed star charts. However, the constellations don't have any boundaries. They're sort of all drawn in randomly. Um, and urinographers begin doing that as they solve fit. Now, ur a urinographer is uh, a person whose job title means a bit more than it did today. He is a person who draws star maps and stuff like that. And that's uh, what they did. So each, each urinographer would have their own star map, and none of them would really line up perfectly. Now, around this same period in time, the European explorers started exploring the southern hemisphere and realizing there's different stars here. If you remember back to the one where the stars were going around, they, they crossed to the south and found these southern circumpolar stars, stars that they couldn't see from where they were. And so, people like Johan, or Johan and Johans start adding more constellations, um, as well as uh, Nicholas Luis. He named a lot, of his scientific, a lot of his constellations after scientific apparatuses, so we have like scales and things like that. Um, in 1922, the International Astronomical Union held its first General Assembly, and it was in Rome, Italy, and they decided that they needed to have a uniform night sky. No more of this random stuff, I think this constellation is this, uh, I think it's that. They, they wanted to do away with that. So they assigned a man named Eugene Delafour the task of uniforming the night sky. And in 1930, he delivers his finished result with the 88 constellations that we now use. This 88 constellations that we talked about in that definition at the very beginning. Uh, to do this, you have to eliminate several, adjust a bunch of them. Here's a sort of view of the inside of the Anka Celestial Sphere of what he was able to do. He basically just added all these borders here and you know, cut up a bunch of them. And so now all the constellations have a bit of you know, property, a bit of territory with them. Basically, he made 88 pieces that fit together in a big spherical puzzle. In, in the same way as like we can use states in, in America to pinpoint exactly where they're looking for, then we can now use constellations because they don't change. We know where they always are. And here's another picture. This is a celestial sphere but from the outside. There's Earth right in the middle, and we're looking from the outpoint in. This is Hercules. You can see it's backwards because we're looking through the back. You can actually look through the end of the sphere and see Orion. All right, so some constellations, as I said, didn't quite make the cut. And here are just a few, triangle and minus, which used to be just above Aries. Uh, Venus the cat was just below Draco and just above Argo. And all these constellations have been just involved, enveloped by other constellations. They were in the reindeer. He is, used to be a north circumpolar constellation. He is now in northern Cephas. Globus Aristaticus, the hot air balloon. Is, or used to be, I should say, just below Capricorn. Capricorn. Uh, Severus, three headed dog, looks kind of fun because I have three different pictures and they all look different. Um, 
while he is called the three-headed dog, he is often depicted as a three-headed snake in Hercules' hand. And one very odd career actually combined him with the apple branch. So that's why this is a picture of a three-headed snake apple branch thing. I'm glad they did away with that. That makes no sense. Uh, other constellations, um, well, they weren't all changed at this one point in time. They've been changing around um, for a lot, throughout the entire history. So let's take this Scorpio. Uh, so the ancient Greeks had these big claws. Um, but we know by the, at least by the first century, that the claws were replaced by a libra, uh, which means like balance, justice, that kind of thing in Latin. And um, we know this is around the first century because there's a saying that Rome was founded when the moon was in Libra. So under the right balance of justice, Rome was founded. And Roma, or Libra obviously had to be established for that saying to make any kind of sense. This is sort of what, this, this is what looks now like now. Another clue that Libra once was part of Scorpio is actually see the name of these stars. And like, stop working. It used to be uh, our upper claw and lower claw. Argo used to be the biggest, or if we had Argo in, in its old state today, it would be the largest constellation in our sky. Um, a giant pirate ship based off of the ship of Jason and the Argonauts when he's standing around the Golden Fleece. Uh, it is now broken up into four constellations, so it's still there, but it's different. So you have the stern, the keel, the sails, and the compass. Um, you might ask, who is to blame that we don't have a giant pirate ship in our night sky? This guy is to blame. All right. Now, why do we care about constellations? Well, for early man, constellations told us a lot about the times and what was going to happen on our Earth. Many cultures believe that what happens in the sky ultimately always reflected the Earth, and vice versa in some cases. So navigating was a huge thing. Uh, the North Star, Polaris, this is the star by which all the other constellations revolve, or appear to revolve, I should say. So that could help you tell you where is north. You know, and if you're out in the middle of the ocean, that could be sort of useful to you. And we built instruments back in the day that just by knowing how high Polaris was above the horizon, you could find your latitude on the Earth. So you could know pretty much where you are. And we developed things like you know these two stars from the Big Dipper point to Polaris. Uh, the middle one in Cassiopeia makes a little arrow that points towards that as well. Um, speaking of the Big Dipper, so I take a little sidetrack. Talk about Ursa Major. Ursa Major is considered to be one of the oldest constellations. Not that its stars are the oldest, or it was the first one to ever just pop out of darkness, but we have uh, documents and stuff that. Roots that traces the roots of this back um, farther than any other constellation, or at least we were pretty sure about that. Um, it's very likely that this originated from an oral story involving a hunter and most likely an elk, and the hunt chases and pursues and ends up in the night sky, and the animals turn into a constellation. Not not a bear, but but a constellation. It's very likely that the bear stemmed from this animal constellation. And this, the Big Dipper, is very useful not only in navigation, but in a lot of other things because it's very, very bright. All right, so, as I was saying, the Big Dipper is useful. You can actually use it to tell uh, what the seasons are, what's sort of going to happen. A lot of tribes use this, depending on where the Big Dipper was and a certain point in the evening, um, where it started out, you could tell when the frosts were going to come, when you should start planting. Things like that. The Greeks developed um, the zodiac to help them tell, tell the same thing. And what this is is it's a top-down view of our solar system or of our, our sun, rather. And this is the Earth, and we're going around it this way. And these are the zodiac signs. Now, these are the constellations that the sun appears to move through. Um, there are 12 of them here. Technically, there's 13. But that's a talk for another time. And whatever month. Uh, the sign depends, depends on um, where the Earth is in position to the sun. So for example, uh, let's say, da, 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 say August, right around here, because I'm a Leo. So the Earth would be here, and in August, the sun actually would be in Leo. So that's how you were given your signs. 
because whatever, whatever month you were born, the sun was in a specific, a specific constellation. Although you couldn't see your constellation during your birthday. You could, only, you could see every other one except for yours. So the Greeks had stories that went with this. For example, Aquarius was the bringer of the bringer, bringer of water, the thaw. And if you look at this point of view, this is from the uh, you know, European uh, aspect of the weather. This is happening around you know, kind of early spring is when it starts to thaw. It's when the earth would be here and the sun would be there. So around the way, March or so. Uh, Pisces, a little bit later on, for Aprilish for us, brings the rains. And then on the other side, Virgo is tells you when the harvest, this time the harvest. And that would be roughly September, a little bit later. So this is sort of how the Greeks used to tell, give them cues as to when to do things. Today we use constellations mainly to help us name stars and pinpoint where they are. Stars are named based on what constellation they're in and how bright they are relative to other constellations. So for example, Beta Ori, and it goes by Alpha, Beta, Gamma, is the second brightest star in Orion, with the constellation we also know that one is right. Uh, Alpha Tau is another one would be the brightest star in Taurus. So by saying that, it lets you easily know what I'm talking about. It's like adding the state onto a city. You know, I'm saying if I'm from Springfield, well, some of you might know there's a Springfield in every state. It doesn't help you at all. If I say Springfield, Missouri, Springfield, Illinois, you now know what I'm talking about. Another unfortunate thing we have today is light pollution. Now in the ancient times, there were no cities throwing up lights all the time, and they can see a lot more stars. That's the, that's the reason if you drive three hours from Columbia to the middle of nowhere, you'll see a lot more stars, because it's obviously a lot less light if you can see those dimmer stars. Right, now we're going to take a look at Orion and sort of follow him around different cultures. Um, starting with the origin of Orion. And when I say Orion, I'm now referring to the constellation, not the Greek character. So he's actually of Sumerian, Sumerian excuse me, origin. Um, this is referring to the myth of Gilgamesh. And we have Gilgamesh, or Uru-Ana, which means the light of heaven, uh, fighting Gudana, or the bull of heaven. And this is a particular part of the epic when Gilgamesh bows his bull. And uh, Orion and the pyramids with the Egyptians, there's a suggested connection between Orion and the Pyramid of Giza, although that's technically not correct, because it's Osiris and the pyramids, because the Greeks stole, or stole, not stole, other constellations from other cultures. And there's, um, Osiris is the Egyptian god of rebirth, and new life, and there's these, you know, air tunnels, air passages that line up to certain points of the stars to help the pharaohs uh, transcend into the afterlife. Uh, to the Greeks, Orion was the most handsomest of men, a, uh, a great hunter. He carries an unbreakable bronze club and a lion's pelt. Sometimes it's a, a shield, but the most common is a lion's pelt and his sword. An interesting fact about Orion is, while the Greeks do mention that Orion is riding a bull, um, because they, the Greeks took both Orion and the bull from the Sumerians, they don't really have any stories about a specific bull that Orion fights. And they don't really have any reason why he would be carrying a specific lion's pelt. Sort of a very specific thing to give a constellation. However, Hercules did both of these things. He skinned a lion who's, um, where he had to kill the lion, and his skin was so hard that he, arrows couldn't pierce. He had to use an actual lion's claws to skin him, and he fought a big bull during the trials of Hercules. So there's a slight connection here. Some have suggested maybe Hercules uh, was in line to be Orion, or Orion was in line to be Hercules, and one lost out over the other. Um, this is the Lakota version of Pan, and while this comes, contains some of the constellations, this, this would be Orion's belt. This is what comes down to be Rigel. If I were to draw Orion out, you can see the other foot over here, and then it would be kind of like that. So this is Orion, but this is what the Lakota used. Which makes sense. They're not everyone's not going to see a man, a specific man. Um, the story behind this hand constellation is sort of interesting. There's a ruler of the skies named Longarm who wants to stop. There's a, a mouth-like 
soul hole here from breathing in life, breathing in souls. And so he, he tries to cover it up. But the twins, who are just sort of two warriors, it doesn't refer to the Gemini twins, they, uh, they battle him and they tear off his arm and they stick it over the hole anyway. And they punch a hole in his hand. And that's why uh, some, it's kind of hard to see in this picture, but some Indian tribes will take a handprint and uh, put it over their hands with the mouth being the palm. The handprint was seen as the enemy trying to kill you and being able to punch through the palm and the sort of the warrior's overcoming of that. So as I mentioned earlier, um, constellations don't always look the same depending on where you are. So this is how we view Orion in the Northern Hemisphere and how they view them in the Southern Hemisphere. Um, specifically in Australia, Orion is you know, not an upside down falling hunter. He's a pot or a saucepan. You can kind of see there's the bottom and there's the, the sword for making up a spoon handle. All right, now we're going to kind of get into a more broad uh, culture, just walking into specific cultures. Starting with the Greeks, now we've talked a lot about the Greeks how many of their constellations we still have today because they influence us and sort of what we hold on to. Much of their mythology survives through um, the constellations. They're definitely one of the most well-known mythologies out there. Uh, they created the zodiac and it's based on the ecliptic, which I sort of mentioned a little bit earlier. That's what the sun, that's the constellations the sun goes through. The ecliptic is the path that the sun, the moon, and the other planets appear to take around our planet. And the reason they're all in the same kind of plane is you imagine our solar system here with the sun right in the middle. Well, all the planets more or less go around in the same plane. I mean, we don't have you know, Earth in here and Jupiter doing this kind of thing out here. They're all in the same area. And our moon goes around us in the same plane as well. So it kind of makes sense that all the, the things that we see across the sky would be more or less in the same plane. So that's, that's why we see that. So the Greeks, they definitely you know, they looked at the skies and the other parts and they made different constellations everywhere, um, except for the southern hemisphere that they couldn't see. But they were they focused on the ecliptic. And that takes us back to the zodiac. This is just another picture. You know, if you're born in March, the sun was in Pisces, so that's your sign. And again, they would use these to tell them when to do, when certain things were going to come. Now, the Navajo were a uh, Native American tribe in the uh, Midwest. And as you might guess, many different tribes, they're all going to have different constellations. It's going to, you know, there's not one set of Native American constellations. Now, they used uh, their constellations, as many primitive peoples did, to tell them when the plants, when the seasons were changing, things like that. They also had a very interesting practice called stargazing. And what that would be is if you were sick, or if you had a big problem, or you needed some sort of answer, you could call a seer. And a seer was a person who was trained in stargazing. And what he would do is he would have a specific star he would look at, he would take a piece of glass, and he would look through the star, and he would see a refraction of light through his glass. And whatever light he saw would, would tell him what ceremonies he needed to perform, what he needed to do. So in the same way that we can take a prism and refract the rainbow from the sun, they could refract the starlight into whatever, and those codes would tell them what to do. So here are some Navajo constellations we'll go in. This is the Big Dipper, uh, but they called it the Northern Male. And you see this for protector. So if we take our understanding of the Big Dipper and flip it over, and add some lines, you can kind of see the similarity where they got that. This is the arm, the arm, the legs, and the head would be right here. And some would be, uh, sometimes they would use him to determine like what, when he was lying down at the vertical at a certain time, it meant something and, and things like that. They also used what's called the planters. We know those Pleiades, and they are in Taurus, right there. Go ahead and zoom up there. And these are called the planters, or the planting stars, because their position on the sky told them when to plant and, and such. The origin story of the planting stars of the Pleiades, I'm sorry, of the planters, not the Pleiades, is very interesting. When the holy people were coming down to this world via a rainbow, uh, these were children that were playing, and they got left behind because they were too busy playing and having fun. So they are forever trapped in the sky. Now, uh, the Navajo 
Navajo, along with, they're not the only Native American tribe to do this, but they have the string game to tell their creation story. And it's kind of interesting, they'll use um, different patterns and stuff to tell how, um, for example, in their coyote came and threw up the stars. I can find it, I'm gonna watch it a little bit. <laughs> A pin that leg and not not no, eighteen old, So if you're interested in watching more of that, you know, just sort of Google Navajo string games by Grandma Margaret. It's really the only thing you find. Not my grandma, by the way. Right. And so the, the one depicted right there is called the North Star. Now, we're going to talk about the Chinese constellations. Now, they were going to spend a bit more time on these because they're very, very different than the modern IAU constellations. And in fact, the Chinese routinely translate their constellations back into their traditional ones rather than keeping um, what the IAU says. Now, they have their sky divided up into three enclosures and 28 mansions. And I think they have 283 constellations. Um, it's sort of hard to find a specific number. But I believe that's what it was at the end of the Han Dynasty, which was a little while ago. But that's that's what they have. Now, whereas the Greeks put a lot of attention into the ecliptic, into the band of the sun and the planets moved through, the Chinese focused on the northern, the polar, the polar stars, the constellations that were there all the time. And the three enclosures were made from the constellations that they could see all the time. Now, so this ring represents the circle of their view. So everything inside the circle they can see around, and everything outside they can only see during part of the time. And from here on out, these will all be Chinese constellations. So there is a Big Dipper, and it's still there. So no Big Dipper. But they are separated by the wall asterisms. Um, an asterism is basically just a piece of a constellation. It's something that's not, uh, like the Big Dipper is an asterism of Ursa Major. So just a piece of it. Now, since they don't follow the IAU, technically all their constellations are asterisms, but I'm not going to be too picky about it. Anyway, so these are the walls. And they separate them into three enclosures. There's the purple forbidden enclosure right here, the supreme palace, and the heavenly market. Now, the Chinese viewed their enclosures as a reflection of like the political, you know, uh, organization of the time. So obviously the most important, you know, the emperor and the very high nobles, they were represented by the purple forbidden, the Supreme Palace is your upper class, and then the heavenly market. I've also seen a translation that says heavenly market and jail. Um, and that's where your lower class, the workers. So the purple forbidden enclosure again is seen right here in the middle. It's the northernmost area of the sky. And these stars are the most important because all the other stars go around it, and you can see these stars in their entirety all year long uh, from the Chinese point of view. Uh, now the Supreme Palace enclosure, this also includes the stars that are kind of outside the circle, like right around here. Now you can see the entirety of the Supreme Palace enclosure during the spring. And likewise, the Heavenly Market enclosure, you can see in its entirety during the late summer and early fall. 
Now, the Chinese also um, divided up. Besides what was overhead, they split up into the north, south, east, and west, and then they split up into 28 mansions. So each direction is represented by a mythical creature, and each mythical creature is associated with a season. Um, and they also have seven mansions assigned to them. So in total, we got 28. Now, um, the reason they're called mansions is they're actually called lunar mansions, and where the Greeks used the sun and the constellations to see, okay, it takes one year for the sun to move through these constellations, or one month for the sun to move through this one constellation. The Chinese said, okay, it takes the moon one day to move through this constellation. Their, their mansions and lunar constellations were much smaller, so it would take the moon seven days to move through one quadrant, and seven more, and seven more. So whereas the Greeks could track the solar year, the Chinese came up with the lunar month. So the same way, from different, same uh, way of tracking time from different angles. So here's uh, the first set, which starts from Dragon of the East, and you can see it's, it's seven, and there's sort of a drawing of how it would look. There's the black tortoise. Um, I know he's not black, but the black tortoise is depicted with a snake and a, tor and a tortoise together. Or the Chinese male and female. Uh, the white tiger containing my favorite asterisk of the hairy head. <laughs> and some of you might recognize this guy right down here. It's the stars we call Orion. Orion and the Big Dipper are the only two constellations that are similar in the Chinese and uh, just as similar as they are to us. Although he's a turtle deep now, he's not a person. The red vermilion bird. South and summer. So if you're getting tight about the seasons, that's pretty interesting. All right, so these are all 28 mansions. They're in no particular order that I know. I don't read Chinese. But let's just kind of see a picture of them. Um, it didn't take, the 28 mansions were not equally spaced. It might take the moon longer to move through one, more than one day to move through one constellation and quicker through. But all seven of them together would make a lunar week. So while you couldn't accurately track, okay, this day will be here, this day will be here, you knew that um, in a month it would be back where it was, and in a week it would be through seven. The Chinese also used astronomy coins. So these would be coins and charms, and, and uh, coin charms specifically represented kind of power, and they were considered good luck. So some were sort of tokens like this, and this is the 28 mansions depicted. There are the seven here with the north, and then the seven, seven, seven in the different directions. This is another coin. It has the sun and the moon. And on the other side, um, they use it to tell stories. So like here we see the Big Dipper, and we see the rising sun, it has directions, uh, east, north, west, setting sun. Milky Way, which they call the Silver River. And it also includes these two constellations. Uh, this is known as the Cowherd, and this is the Weaver Girl. And the Chinese, it was a very popular story, I guess the mythology that they used. And so the story between these two was there was a cowherd coming along one day, and he spies several fairy daughters bathing naked in the lake. And so as a joke, he steals her clothes. And when the fairy daughters realize what's going on, they make the youngest one go out and get him. So when the cowherd sees the youngest fairy daughter in all of her glory, uh, he proposes marriage immediately, which she happily, happily accepts. And so they have two kids, and their life is great, until uh, the fairy goddess, who's the mother of the fairy daughters, finds out about this and orders the fairy daughter to return home. So the fairy daughter returns home, the cowherd is heartbroken, he's very sad, and he turns to his magical ox buddy, who enters the story at this point, and says, hey, you can cut me up and skin me and use my hide to fly up there and be with her. And so he reluctantly does this, he kills his magical cow and takes his hide, he wraps his two children, one and then the other, and he flies up uh, to meet the weaver girl in the sky. 
uh, the goddess um, sees his plan. She sees him coming, and she takes one of her hairpins and scratches a river in the night sky. So that's where the Silver River comes from. And um, so he's forever separated from her. I don't know why they're on the same side of the coin, but he's shown chasing her because he can never catch her. But he's always trying to get her. Now, it's not a total sad ending because once a year during the festival of the magpies, I believe, all the magpies fly up to the heavens and make a bridge for these two lovers to be cross and be with, be with each other for one night. I think it's sort of like a Valentine's Day festival, but I'm not an expert on that. Alright, so this is sort of our night sky. If we take the ecliptic, uh, the uh, celestial sphere, excuse me, and lay it out um, flat, like you would take a globe and lay it flat. So there's going to be a little distortions on the top and bottom, but not that bother you too much. This is the Chinese constellations. Um, they've added some from the, the southern here. They would not have known about these, but they've been added in since. And the ones in orange, uh, the orange side of the line, is the ecliptic path, path to the moon, stars, planets, stuff like that. And the other ones are their lunar mansions. And you can see there's the bird peak, or, or Orion, as we call it. Um, it's kind of hard to see in the light, but you can see with the lunar mansions, it takes very few time to go from here to here, because this one's much longer than this one. But again, the, the times from each one of each of the quadrants are about the same. So this is the ancient Greek sky. Um, we can see the zodiac, the twins, the Gemini twins, and Taurus, and everybody like that. There's our buddy Orion again, as we know him. And this is how we see the sky right now. It's kind of hard to tell, but all the lines and stuff are drawn in that we we talked about earlier with the IAU stuff, and then the southern hemisphere has been filled in. And so, the question I will leave you tonight with is, what do you see?